uh, out of Matthew uh, 20, verses uh, 20 through 23, and in this section of Scripture, of what we see as a mother's request. Uh, let me read it for you. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to Jesus with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something, and he said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Say that these two sons of mine are to set one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. Jesus answered, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, We are able. He said to them, You will drink my cup, but to set at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. Well, today is Mother's Day, and as I was preparing for today, it used to be I would, uh, uh, you know, before we had files on our computers and folders, I would cut things out, and then I had a filing system, and, and I happened to come across an old uh, uh, article from the March 1988 edition of Reader's Digest, and it's kind of a historical thing about what mothers might have said before their sons became famous, and uh, Mrs. Moore said to her son Samuel, stop tapping your fingers on the table, it's driving me crazy. <laughs> Mrs. Lindsberg said, Charles, can't you do anything by yourself? And if you remember, he gained fame by uh, being the first person to fly solo, nonstop from Paris to New York City. And then Mrs. Washington, and this was kind of a pun, George never did have a head for money. <laughs> and uh, it, yeah, it sunk in, didn't it? Uh, and then Mrs. Armstrong said, Neil has no more business taking flying lessons than the man on the moon. <laughs> and then Theodore Roosevelt, and this one's a bit more serious. Of course, he was our 26th president from uh, 1901 to 1909. And he said, when all is said, it is the mother and the mother only who is a better citizen than the soldier who fights for his country. The successful mother, the mother who does her part in rearing and training aright, the boys and girls who are to be the men and women of the next generation, is of greater use to the community and occupies, if she would only realize it, a more honorable as well as more important position than any man in it. The mother is the one supreme asset of the national life. She is more important by far than the successful statesman or businessman or artist or scientist. And as I thought about you know, what Roosevelt had said there, I reflected on some of the important lessons of life that my mother taught me. And you, you all probably got this one about personal hygiene. Make sure you wear clean underwear in case you're in an accident, you know, and have to go to the hospital. Uh, then she gave us, gave us some lessons on safety. Where I grew up, it was down on Frederick Drive. It was a great, great place to grow up because... We had these large fields around us and a golf course. The golfers didn't like us, but it was a playground for us anyhow. Uh, but we had this one tree, and because I was larger than uh, most of the other guys, uh, I was the one, I was the test dummy. Or maybe I was just too, maybe I was just so dumb I was always the dummy. I don't know. But every year we always got a new rope and a new gunny sack filled with whatever we could, we could find. And we climbed up to this high branch where we had this, this, uh, this rope. And, and we weren't smart enough to know at that time that you really need a, the higher branch and jump off the lower branch. But I would jump off that, that one branch hanging on the gunny sack, thinking it would just, when it hit bottom, we'd just swing out. But when the rope came to an end, invariably I kept going. And in and, and the safety lesson, my mom said, if you fall out of that tree and break your neck, don't come crying to me. I've told you time and time again to stay out of it. But I'd always come, go home scuffed up and bruised. She gave us lessons on perseverance. Eat a little bit of that broccoli each time and you'll learn to like it. And finally, I did get to where I like broccoli. Choices. The choice is yours. Eat what's on your plate or leave the table hungry. I'm no short order cook. And then prayer. I got this lesson on around the 4th of July one year when, you, you know, I told you I was kind of a dummy. You know, you shouldn't light fireworks inside the house. She said, boy... You'd better pray that carpet can be cleaned and that can be patched where nobody can see it. <laughs> and then I thank my wife for this one because we were, we've were we been doing some work in a room at the house and uh, she found a book by Zig Ziglar and it reminded me of, a, of an old quote by Ziglar. As youngsters, my mother taught her children that while we might not be the smartest people around, we could be courteous, polite, and considerate of others. 
Well, what lessons can we learn from this woman in our story out of Matthew chapter 20? The woman is described as the mother of the sons of Zebedee, and there's speculation as to who she is, but most likely I think she was Salome, the sister of Mary, and I get that out of John chapter 19. And so that would make her the aunt of Jesus, and her sons, James and John, would be his cousins. Salome was one of the faithful followers of Christ. She was among the women who were present at the cross when he was crucified and among those who uh, served as witnesses of the empty tomb. I've heard a lot of criticism about the request that Salome made. But from a mother's perspective, from an aunt's perspective, wanting the best for her children, she was seeking the best life had to offer from the one who had the best of life to give. Lesson number one is Salome taught her sons how to approach the Lord. She kneeled down and asked for a favor. And by kneeling down, that speaks to us about a spirit of humility. And Peter spoke about that in chapter 5 of his, of his letter. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your cares on him because he cares for you. Humility. James spoke about it in his fourth chapter. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Now, James was, was a kind of in-your-face teacher. And he was not shy about using his authority to give commands. And the word draw and the word humble are in the imperative, which means they're commands. It's not a matter of, well, do it if you feel like doing it. No, it's a command to draw near to God, and then he'll draw near to you, to humble yourself on the side of the Lord, and then he'll lift you up. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, a, a, uh, a very well-known preacher across the continents, across the sea, we have to be poor in spirit before we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. But the problem in the world today is we are so full of ourselves and our arrogance and our pride, we do not leave room for the Lord and His Spirit to work in our lives. In Colossians 3, 2, Paul said, Clothe yourselves with the heart of mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. You get that? That's the clothing we're supposed to wear. That ought to be our fashion statement as Christians. Clothing of, with, of mercy, of kindness, of humility, gentleness, and patience. Here's another lesson. She taught her sons a lesson on boldness. In Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17, it says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons. You get that? We, have, we can approach the throne of God boldly because we're one of his children. You know, growing up, most of us had that sense, and I don't know if we would call it boldness or confidence, but we had that sense that we could ask our parents for something that we couldn't ask from other adults. And that's what we get here out of Romans chapter 8 by by. Uh, being born again by becoming Christians, we've been adopted into the family of God. And we, it says here in this chapter, can cry out, Abba, Father, the same words Jesus used in the Garden of Gethsemane. It goes on to say, the Spirit himself bears witness. Now, keep those two words in mind, bears witness. I'm going to come back to him, uh, to those. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. You see, we're part of the family of God, so we've got the family right to approach the throne of grace. But those two words bear witness. Those, that's one word in the Greek, and it's a word from which we get the word martyr. A martyr is someone who died because he would boldly bear witness of Jesus Christ. And in here, we have the Spirit bearing witness on behalf of, of Jesus and bearing witness with our spirit that we are part of the family. You know, people do genealogy now to find out about their family ancestors. 
Well, we don't have to do a spiritual genealogy because the Spirit is already bearing witness with our spirit to testify that we are children of God and we are heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Salome also taught her sons to make specific requests. In Jeremiah 33.3 it says, Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. God wants us to go to him in prayer and call out what it is that we want. It's not just one of these bless everybody and bless my life. God wants us to be very specific in our prayers. Oftentimes somebody will say, well, pray for me. And I'll say, well, what exactly do you want me to pray about? You know, what is your ailment? What is your sickness? What is, the, what is your need in life? Because I want to be very specific uh, when, when I pray because I want to know when God answers the prayer. I mean, how do you know when God answers a bless, bless everybody prayer? You know, uh, God wants us to be specific so that we can see him working in our lives. Now, Philippians chapter 4, and this is a passage that is uh, very familiar with people. But in this passage, Paul said the same thing. The same lesson that Salome taught her children is the same lesson that Paul was teaching the church at Philippi. Let your requests be made known to God. Now, I'm going to read this out of the Amplified Version. Rejoice in the Lord always, delight, take pleasure in Him. Again, I will say rejoice, let your gentle spirit, your graciousness, unselfish, mercy, tolerance, and patience be known to all people. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious or worried about anything, but in everything, every circumstance and situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, continue to make your specific request known to God. And the peace of God... That peace which reassures the heart, that peace which transcends all understanding, that peace which stands guard over your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus is yours. Now, I don't know if you caught it when I was reading it, but just prior to where it says, do not be anxious, some versions say do not worry, but it's, it's the Greek word from which we get anxious or anxiety. But just before Paul says don't be anxious, what did he say? He said, the Lord is near. Don't be anxious. He's right there with us, regardless of what the trial is, regardless of what the need is. And before we even ask it, God has the resources available to meet those needs. And the great thing about it is when God answers your prayer or your prayer, it never diminishes his resources to where he cannot answer my prayer. God can supply all of our needs according to his riches, through Christ Jesus our Lord. Salome taught her sons the importance of being involved in ministry for the Lord Jesus. You see, her desire was for her sons to follow the Lord, to be a part of the ministry in the coming kingdom. Even though she didn't understand everything about it, she wanted her sons involved. Notice in Matthew chapter 10, we're talking about ministry. Whoever wants to be great, uh, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, Jesus said desire needs to always be partnered with determination and dedication. It's not enough just to desire it, but are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to have the sense of humility, the spirit of humility? Are you willing to allow his spirit to bear witness with your spirit and to lead you out into the fields that are white to harvest? You see, too often we want a crown without a cross. We want a throne without sacrifice and we want glory without suffering. And when Salome came and brought this request for her sons, he wasn't quite sure that she understood everything that she needed to understand. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul, uh, Paul spoke of the cost of ministry. He said, we're experiencing trouble on every side but are not crushed. We're perplexed but not driven to despair. We're persecuted but not abandoned. We're knocked down but not destroyed, always carrying around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in your body in our bodies. Salome said, Lord, she could have said, now nephew, this is what your aunt wants. But she said, Lord, 
Let my son set one on the right hand and one on the left in the coming kingdom. And Jesus said, are you really understanding what you're asking? You see, Jesus had to suffer before he would be glorified. And at this point in their lives, James and John were unaware of what the future held for them. So when Jesus enlightened them, he told his two cousins, you will drink my cup, but to set at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it's for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And ultimately, James was beheaded. And John was tortured and then exiled to the Isle of Patmos for the sake of Jesus Christ. James and John not only talked the talk, but they walked the walk. In 3 John chapter 1, John said, I have no greater joy, and this is when he's an aged old man, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And that is what John wanted for his disciples. It's what Jesus wants for each and every one of us. And it's what every mother wants for her children. It's for us to walk in truth and to follow the Lord. Would you bow with me in prayer? Well, fathers, I come now in Jesus' name. We want to thank you, Lord, for the mothers that are present here. We want to thank you, Lord, for their influence on our lives. And it's my prayer today, Father, that we will do exactly what mothers want their sons to do and what John spoke about, that we'll walk in truth that we'll honor you, that we'll honor our families, that we'll live a life, Father, of humility, that you might get the glory out of all that's done. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand with me today as we get ready to sing a song of invitation. Come as we sing this song. <laughs>